Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan River to be baptized by him. The Lord had promised to give John a sign whereby he might know who was the Messiah. And now, as Jesus went up out of the water, the promised sign was given. For he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God, like a dove of burnished gold, hovered over the head of Christ Jesus. When Jesus presented himself to John for baptism, Satan was among the witnesses. He saw the lightnings flash from the cloudless sky. He heard the majestic voice of Jehovah that resounded through heaven and echoed throughout the earth like peals of thunder, announcing, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. When Jesus was led into the wilderness to be tempted, he was led by the Spirit of God. He went to the wilderness to be alone, to contemplate his mission and his work. Now was Satan's opportunity. He resolved to appear as one of the angels of light. Satan had exercised his power of hypnotism over Adam and Eve, and this power he now strives to exercise over Jesus. Divinity flashed through suffering humanity, writhing with humiliation and rage Lucifer was forced to withdraw from the presence of the world's Redeemer. Christ's victory in the Mount of Temptation was complete. Mine hour is not yet come. But before we go into this topic, an affirmation of faith taken from Steps to Christ, this time regarding the new birth. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Steps to Christ 21. The heart of God yearns over his earthly children with a love that is stronger than death. The Gospel of John chapter 3 verse 7. Ye must be born again. Steps to Christ this time page 18. There must be a power working from within. A new life from above before men, comma, and women, I'm sure, can be changed from sin to holiness. That power is Christ Jesus. The book of Acts, there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Again, mine hour is not yet come. Story of redemption. Christ, the precious Son of God, was led forth and delivered to the people to be crucified. The mother of Jesus was also there, supported by John. Her heart was stricken with unutterable anguish. The Savior, from loss of blood and excessive weariness and pain, fell fainting to the ground. When Jesus revived, the cross was again placed upon his shoulders and he was forced forward. He staggered on a few steps, then fell again as one lifeless to the ground. He was at first pronounced to be dead, but finally he again revived. Upon arriving at the place of execution, the condemned three men were bound to the instruments of torture. Jesus made no resistance. Again, the mother of Jesus looked upon with agonizing suspense, hoping that he would work a miracle to save himself. After Jesus was nailed to the cross, it was lifted by several powerful men and thrust into the ground with great violence into the place prepared for it, causing the most excruciating agony to the Son of God. With unutterable amazement, the angels of heaven beheld the infinite love of Jesus, who thought only of others. The sun refused to look upon the awful scene. Its full, bright rays were illuminating the earth at midday, when suddenly it seemed to be blotted out. Complete darkness enveloped the cross and all the vicinity about. This awful darkness lasted three full hours. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. 
There was a violent earthquake. The people were shaken together in heaps. In the surrounding mountains, rocks were rent asunder, and they went crashing down into the plains. Creation she seemed to be shivering to atoms. Thus far, three topics. The baptism of the Messiah, an affirmation of faith that we need every day and every Sabbath from steps to Christ regarding the new birth, and the crucifixion of the Messiah. What do these have to do with mine hour is not yet come. How did Jesus know when his hour would be? How did he know what would take place when these circumstances transpired? And so we look into the Gospels and we see the references of Scripture where Jesus declared, or it was declared on his behalf, mine hour is not yet come. If you like statistics, you'll find this interesting. Because there are three references in the Gospels, all actually in the Gospel of John, where Jesus, it is referred to, uh, his, and the statement is made, mine hour, or his hour, is not yet come. Three references. Interestingly, there are six references in the Gospels regarding the fact, when it came to pass, that his hour had come. Three references to mine hour is not yet come, wedding miracle, feast of tabernacles, Mary Magdalene. We'll look at these. Six references, two, 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 in the temple, at the Last Supper, and in Gethsemane. Let's go back now, and we look at the Gospel of John, and we're reading in chapter 2, verse 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke. John, you know where that Gospel is. Chapter 2, and reading in verse 4. This is what it says here in this information. Do you not remember that the first miracle that Jesus performed was at a wedding? Quite appropriate. Weddings are a significant occasion for celebration, right even to this day. And there have been many weddings, delightful occasions, that have been celebrated right here in this sanctuary. And way back, a quarter of a century ago, it was my privilege to participate in some of these wedding ceremonies also. And so here, as the first miracle performed by the Lord, when he began his official ministry as the Messiah, a time period that lasted only three and a half years, the first ceremony was the wedding at Cana. I've been there, a little village on the edge of the main highway. And so there was this feast there. Jesus was called and his disciples and the family as well. And it was suggested to the Lord, his mother made this suggestion, why don't you turn the water into wine? How does she know that he would perform miracles? He was divinity. Divinity made humanity. Divinity come from heaven as the creator of planet Earth as the creator of the human race. And then he stepped into the human race to provide redemption. Quite remarkable. Quite remarkable. And so Jesus said to his mother, verse 4, woman, and this is a respectful statement. It doesn't look like that in English, but remember that they were talking in the Aramaic language back then, and it was respectful. Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. He was beginning his messianic ministry. And he made the statement at the beginning of his ministry, my hour has not yet come. He's going to minister, he's going to preach, he's going to teach, he's going to provide salvation, but his hour has not yet come. John 7 verse 30, another one of these remarkable statements, of which there are just three, John 7, and reading in verse 30, it says here that Jesus um, was, they, they attempted to arrest him, they wanted to kill him. There were several occasions when there was an attempt made on the life of the Messiah. You heard me make the statement on previous occasions that I consider that the first attempt that was made on his life 
was an abortion at the time when Mary had to travel at full term on a jerky donkey two weeks in duration or otherwise walking from way up there in Nazareth down to Bethlehem. That is not the procedure that is recommended for a new mother. But here there had been an attempt on his life. Verse 25, John 7, 25. Then says some of them in Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? Why were they so angry with the Lord? He could perform miracles. He could heal the sick. That would be useful for some of us today in these circumstances of life, wouldn't it? He was able to speak other languages with people that he met in certain circumstances, Roman citizens, Roman soldiers, the lady down on the coast who spoke a type of Greek language. He performed miracles, he fed people. Why were they so angry with him? You and I will never understand that because we are within the pale of salvation. It doesn't make sense to others. And so here um, we find then Jesus is in the temple, verse 28, teaching. Uh, he says, you know me, you've heard what I've seen, you know where I came from, you know where I was born. Um, and verse 30, then they sought to take him. They wanted to arrest him. But no man dared lay hands on him because of what? His hour was not yet come. Second statement. Third one. Turn the page, same book, Gospel of John, written by the Lord's close relative and uh, a cousin by birth. And here in John 8 verse 20, you have a similar statement. And you might remember the experience, every pastor sooner or later has preached on this topic. Every Adventist, every Christian has heard the story of the prodigal girl. We know the prodigal man, prodigal son, that's a familiar story, and that's also told in every Christian church. And every Christian has heard that story many times and has read it in the Bible. And here's the story of the prodigal girl, prodigal daughter. And you know what took place? She was set up deliberately by the leaders. She was dragged, probably unclothed, we would suggest, and brought before the Lord. And uh, you'll notice here that Jesus gave a testimony against those who had brought, him, brought her in. And the men who were guilty of sometimes similar events in their experience, they were there accusing this woman. And Jesus bent down and wrote in the dust that was there on that um, marble platform of the temple area. Square type. Uh, uh, script not like we use in English but in Aramaic and he wrote the information down there we are told in such a way that it applied to each person that was accusing this girl in order of age and when they saw what was there they quietly disassembled and went their way but anyway, that's the story. You've heard it before. That's not new. And uh, when you see these things, um, we look now at verse, let me see, chapter 8, verse 20. Uh, these words spoke Jesus in the treasury. What did he say? It was re regarding uh, these uh, matters that uh, were referred to here. And uh, in verse 20, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no man laid hands on him. Why? For his hour was not yet come. Very significant statement. A time reference. Now, you've, we've looked at the three referring to the fact that his hour coming would be future. Now look at the, double, the three pairs of the statements where his hour has come. We begin a few more pages over in the Gospel of John, looking at chapter 12, John 12, 23. Jesus is now in the temple area. And as you know, in those days, they did not go into the temple to worship. They went to the temple and they worshipped. We come today into the sanctuary and worship the Lord. But in those days, that was not the case. 
And so Jesus was teaching there. He went to the temple area. And this was the final occasion. He began his ministry with a visit to the temple and the cleansing of the temple. You remember that? Overturning the money changers uh, and uh, the tables and so forth and driving out the animals and so on. There was chaos in the area and he wanted reverence and respect for his temple and its services. Now, three and a half years later, this is the end of his ministry and he's in the temple again. John 12 verse 23, straight after the triumphal entry. And you know, the whole world, the whole population, the whole city followed him on the triumphal entry to the top of the Mount of Olives. You can see the whole city of Jerusalem. You look down on it. I've been there. You've seen, I've seen it. And some of you folk have too. And you can look down onto the temple. And Jesus was there. And instead of rejoicing with everybody in the triumphal entry, he burst into bitter, bitter tears. Why? Because of the impenitence of his own people, his own race that he had come to share salvation with. And so here he is now in the temple for the final occasion. John 12, 23. This is what it says here. And uh, verse, Jesus answered them, and in his own words he says, The hour is come. He came into the world for a specific purpose. Now the climax is arriving. The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Glorified? Crucified? Did you know that there are crucifixions of Christians now in some Muslim countries? They are causing, they're pouring um, anger and um, hatred against Christianity and cr crucifying sometimes Christians. That is hideous. And here Jesus was about to be crucified and he describes it as his glory. I look now at uh, chapter 12, the same chapter this time, and we're looking at verse 27. And he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what can I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's making a prayer that he know cannot be answered that way. And he says here, But for this cause came I unto this hour. That's the final visit in the temple. Now in the uh, upper room, John 13, verse 1. Let me see, same page. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, yeah, but there was crucifixion before that. And you look in John chapter 17, verse 1, and you find the statement again. These words spoke Jesus and lifted his eyes up to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. And you know, we as God's humble, contrite followers, following the Lord Jesus and the ways of salvation, we try to honour the Father. Never at the same level as the Lord could do, but we do in our own lives attempt to exemplify the plan of salvation. And so John 17, 1, at the uh, Lord's Supper, the hour is come. And you look at uh, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 45, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. He was in the heart of the earth, three days and three nights. Casual reading says, yeah, okay, that was the grave. But you and I know from the information and the intensity of the involvement of these factors and matters that it was the beginning of the visit into the Garden of Gethsemane that he came into the heart of the earth. Sin and its involvement and the fact that he was cut off from divinity for a time period in these things. Matthew 26, 45. Behold, the hour is at hand. Mark 14, 41, Gethsemane, the hour is come. Now, if Jesus at the beginning of his ministry could make a time declaration and he could state, my hour is not yet come, if he could state at the end of three and a half years of ministry, a wholesome, practical, Christian ministry, which was despised by the people and by the leaders, 
If he could make these time declarations in this way, how did he know about these things? He had to gain his salvation, his obedience to salvation, in the same way that we do from Holy Scripture. And you might note that you have a sheet of paper there, and on the sheet of paper you have a time statement. Two pages, two sides, one side today, the next side, after you have given it back and we give them out again uh, in March, we will uh, use the second side, which is highly significant for us as God's Seventh-day Adventist Christian people. But on the side that is mainly white, you have the time prophecy here. Did Jesus understand the time prophecies? Let's read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24 and verse 15. Matthew, looking at chapter 24 and reading in verse 15. And it says here, in the words of Jesus, he is talking with four of his disciples upon the Mount of Olives, overlooking the city of Jerusalem at the time towards sunset on the last day, uh, one of the last days of his ministry upon planet Earth. And in verse 15, in this discourse, Matthew 24, he says, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world for a witness unto all nations, verse 14. Then shall the end come. And you and I know that the gospel message has been preached, is being preached in all the world. So the end is on the horizon. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by whom? By Daniel the prophet. Did Jesus understand the book of Daniel? Yeah. Do you understand the book of Daniel? Yes, you do. You understand many things about the book of Daniel. You've heard it presented from this sacred desk by the church pastors so, uh, over a period of time. You have heard it presented in evangelistic programs here on this platform, in the hall over there, and in other ways. It's been given in Bible studies. You do understand the book of Daniel. Is there more yet that you can understand from Daniel? Most certainly, particularly Daniel chapter 11, which is beginning to be fulfilled in the last few verses in our era at the present time with the rise of Islam. There's more coming, more coming in all of these things, we are sure. And so Jesus here, he told his apostles, look, study the book of Daniel and you know what the time prophecies are. So let's go back then. And we will look at the, gospel, at the book of uh, Daniel and we will see these things. But you know, it's an interesting thing. Who was it that gave the information of the book of Revelation to the Apostle John? It was Jesus, the resurrected the Lord, and Gabriel, correct? Who was it that gave the prophecies in the book of Daniel? to the prophet Daniel. It was Michael the archangel before his birth into our planet as Jesus the Messiah, and it was the angel Gabriel. And so Jesus is now drawing attention to the same prophecies that he himself gave to Daniel before he was born as a human being. Quite remarkable. Now, let's remember that the Hebrews were God's chosen people back at that time. Are you clear on that? Indeed. Are the Jews God's chosen people today? No, they were dispossessed after the beginning of the Christian era. Then why do these evangelists on television draw attention to the Jewish people and say that so much should be taken into account on their behalf? Now, humanitarian issues, certainly, and we can agree with that. But as far as a fulfillment of religion and prophecy, totally impossible. We need to follow the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, not what comes on television in some of these programs regarding these matters. The Hebrews were, at the time, God's chosen people. You'll remember that they were taken into the Babylonian captivity in the time of Daniel, in the year 605 BC. Remember that year, 605, because not next occasion when I preach here, but the third occasion, we're going to use that uh, particular date for a particular reason. Very interesting. 
Very interesting. So Daniel was taken a prisoner from Jerusalem back to Babylon. And uh, the children of Israel spent 70 years in this captivity. Daniel says there were 70 years. And then they made a return journey led by Zerubbabel, who was a descendant of King David. A descendant of King David is therefore a member of the royal family. So they were led back from Babylon, from Iraq and Iran, if you please, back to Palestine. It was a mass migration of at least 42,360 people. And if you count all of the women folk and the others who went with them, somewhere around about one crore of people, 100,000 people in that mass migration. But that's not the largest. Don't you remember the children of Israel left Egypt? In a mass migration, how many was that? That was two and a half million. However did they organize them? However did they feed them? However did they have enough water for them? Well, we know how they were fed, don't we? It wasn't the manna from God on a daily basis. Okay, so the children of Israel were led from the Babylonian captivity back to Palestine by Prince Zerubbabel. But when they got back there, they started to rebuild the city, and they had lots of difficulty, political difficulties. The neighboring Arab tribes did not want the Jews to be reestablished back then in Palestine and in Jerusalem. So the neighboring Arab tribes, you can read it in Ezra and Nehemiah, they were hindering the building and the rebuilding, the reconstruction of the city of Jerusalem. Now take our sheet of paper, and you'll see the date there, 457, 457 B.C. I'm reading in Daniel chapter 9, and looking at verse 23 onwards, and that was read by the elder a little while ago. Verse 22, and he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, this is Gabriel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. 23. At the beginning of your supplications, the commandment came. God sent me down here to talk with you. 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, uh, and so forth. And uh, you'll notice down here, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. It'll be seven weeks and so forth. That is the beginning of the time prophecy. Now the evangelists have told you the same thing before. You've heard it, you know about it. We know that one day it was a year. On the occasion when I visited Egypt in the most recent time, I went to the land of Goshen and uh, I wanted to see the cities where Abraham visited and where Joseph uh, ministered, where he was prime minister. The cities are in total ruin, but uh, massive stone objects with, with the Egyptian carvings all over them, very evident. And uh, the guide that is on duty there took me down into a tomb area of a pharaoh of Egypt, an obscure pharaoh. He was very important at the time, but obscure in the today's understanding. And they showed me on the wall, as I went down uh, on the ground level, they showed me all of this Egyptian painting with all of these figures and uh, all of these uh, inscriptions and so forth. And I've discovered that you can read those in any language. You can read them in English, you can read them whatever language. It's picture writing, it's not a script like we have in English. But down there, in one long row, was a silhouette in black of the pharaoh. Exactly the same picture, multiple times, one after the other, 20, 30, 40, 50 of them. And the guide said, when you have a picture like that of all of the, of the pharaoh represented in all of these consecutive silhouettes, it's one day, one day indicated. But because there's so many, it's one day for a year. So every one of these indicates how long he was reigning, one day for a year. So we know it in the Bible, and the ancient Egyptians understood it also, which is quite interesting. And so the beginning of this time period 
uh, is 457 BC. So what happened at that particular time? Go to the book of Ezra, looking at chapter 7 and verse 11. Do you know where Ezra is found? Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. Ezra chapter 7 and looking at verse 11. This is what it says here. Also, I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word, and so you go through there and you can read in English the decree that was written in the Aramaic language in its original. And you can't understand the Aramaic language, and neither can I. So we're glad to have it in English so that we can understand it. But this decree was issued by Artaxerxes Longimanus. Now, that doesn't mean very much, I suppose, but it's an interesting thing because there is more known about this pharaoh, about this uh, Artaxerxes uh, than uh, in the Persian Empire than is given in the Bible, well known in history. And he was called Longimanus because one hand, his right hand, was longer than his left hand. And that was what Longimanus means. And uh, he issued uh, this decree in the year 457 BC. His medical case is described today as neurofibromatosis. Can you remember that name? Doesn't matter if you can't. It's called neurofibromatosis. That's what it's called today. So he issued this decree, and as a result of this decree, there was another mass migration given in Ezra, the next chapter, of 8,000 people. And it took these 8,000 people four months to travel from Iraq, Iran, over to Jerusalem and reestablish themselves. So that was the year 457 BC. Now, is that very significant? Not to us today excepting that it's the beginning of this time period that Jesus understood and could say, my hour has not yet come. He knew when he would begin his ministry. He knew when he would end his ministry. So there were seven weeks, seven times seven, 49, 49 years later, gives us, as you've got on the sheet of paper there, the year 408 B.C., so what happened on, uh, in the year 408 BC? Daniel 9.25 tells us here that re the rebuilding of Jerusalem would be completed after seven weeks. Seven times seven, 49. Now, I have searched in the Bible. I have searched in the spirit of prophecy. I have searched in Jewish history. I have searched in secular history. And there is no information whatsoever that is given in any location regarding what happened in Jerusalem in the year 408 B.C. The critic says, okay, the prophecy was made, but it was never fulfilled. I would suggest that that criticism is inaccurate. I would suggest that the prophecy was made, and it was fulfilled, but we don't know the details of the fulfillment. Because every prophecy of the Lord is fulfilled, will be fulfilled according to the way it is given in Scripture. The Bible says in the writings of Daniel, the city would be rebuilt, the city would be reestablished, and it was. It's just that we don't understand, don't know the details of these things in a specific way. Now we move on, and you're on the sheet of paper, you'll see the next date is A.D. 27. So what happened in the year A.D. 27. Let's turn to the book of Daniel again. Daniel chapter 9, and looking at verse 25 from that well-known book that we've all read many times. Daniel 9, and looking at verse 25. It says, therefore, there, uh, in this verse, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to rebuild and to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem unto, unto, unto Messiah the Prince. And then it gives you the time period there in totality, which is 62 plus 7, which is 69 multiplied by 7, and you've got uh, a time period that ends in the year A.D. 27. What happened in A.D. 27? Mark 1 tells about the baptism. 
with which you are very familiar, and many of you people have been baptized in honor of the Lord's direction in this way. Some of you younger folk need one day to consider the matter of baptism. Desire of Ages 111. Jesus did not receive baptism as a confession of guilt on his own account. He did not need it. He identified himself with sinners taking the steps that we are to take. Two pages over, God spoke to Jesus on the occasion of his baptism as our representative. God spoke to the Lord as our representative. With all of our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. That's good, isn't it? It gives hope to all human beings, including every one of us in the sanctuary today. And so the baptism of Jesus took place in the year 27 according to the prophecy that was made. Jesus knew when his hour was coming. This was the beginning of his ministry and he knew that three and a half years later would be the end of all things. So what happened in AD 31, Daniel 9:26, After three score and two weeks, the total time period that is involved here, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. It's for you, for me. And so it is listed here regarding these matters. What happened? Matthew 27, 35, you understand the story of the crucifixion. You've heard the presented in the sermons. You have read it in the Gospels. Desire of Ages, 753. In that thick darkness of that cross, the presence of God the Father was hidden. Did you know that the crucifixion was of such tremendous importance to the entire universe, not only planet Earth, but to the entire universe, that God the Father left eternity, left heaven above, and came down to planet Earth at the time while Jesus was on the cross and he was hidden in the darkness around the cross that was surrounding that area. Massive importance attached to this event. I read it again in Desire of Ages 7.53. In that thick darkness about the cross, the presence of God the Father was hidden. God the Father and his holy angels were beside the cross. That places a tremendous value and importance upon your salvation and mine also. That if the Father would leave heaven above to come to us upon planet Earth at this occasion then we can see the significance. And finally, the final date that we have is 34. And what happened there? Daniel 9.24 says here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression. After that time, the Jewish people would be dispossessed of their high heritage, their high privilege and opportunity. No longer would they be God's chosen people. Jesus introduced the story of the Christian church. And from that time onwards, you have the information about God's people upon planet Earth. Acts chapter 8 tells the story of the stoning of Stephen. You know that, you read it before. Acts of the Apostles, page 106. They, the apostles, the early believers, were to carry to the world the glad tidings of salvation through Christ. We leave the story unfinished. On March... 30, Sabbath 30th, we will continue with the story of from that time down to 1844. And because this time prophecy ends with the rise of the Advent movement, then it has tremendous importance for you and tremendous importance for me and all of God's people. On the third occasion, we'll go from that date onwards to our own era and beyond with some of the things that will be fulfilled in these matters. I read regarding revival and reformation as we come to the close of part one. And in Prophets and Kings 6.23, and we told a little of the story of Ezra. Prophets and Kings 6.23, wherever Ezra labored, there sprang up a revival in the study of the Holy Scriptures. And if you want revival and reformation in your life, in your family, and in your church, in our church, then this needs to be predicated based upon a study of Holy Scripture. Practical, sensible, progressive, developmental. 
supportive with the information in the spirit of prophecy. Wherever Ezra labored, there sprang up a revival in the study of the Holy Scriptures. That brought a revival and reformation. That will bring a revival and reformation here. I mentioned the resignation of the Pope, the huge meteor over Russia. This is part of an unfinished story. I mentioned that the first hymn was written by Catherine Hankey, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Her other hymn, which is the one we're about to sing now, I Love to Tell the Story, similar as was written by Catherine Hankey. Next March, we will tell the story and use the other hymn written by Fanny Crosby. One at a time, we will turn to number 457 today as our final hymn, I Love to Tell the Story. <laughs> 